and product profitability using at risk to enhance strategic decision making. Presented by Steve Schultz of Movable Feast Mobile Media. My name is Jameson Romeo Hall, and I will be your host today. And I'll be available to help answer technical questions by chat. At this time, all attendees are in a listen-only mode. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience today. The attendee list is suppressed to maintain attendee privacy. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation today by clicking on the Q&A panel. I would also encourage you to visit our website and sign up for a free trial download of our software, including our lead products at risk and the decision tool suite. We invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy today's presentation. Steve, you can take it away. Thank you, Jameson. Um, I'd like to thank you and Palisade for the opportunity to present this. Um, again, I am Steve Schultz. I'm the founder and CEO of Movable Feast Mobile Media. We're going to go into a quick case study that uses at risk in a fairly simple, straightforward uh, manufacturing model. Um, you'll, you, you might uh, wonder why a mobile media CEO is talking about uh, production and manufacturing. First of all, because it's a, it's a really great example, I do have some background in manufacturing and, uh, and production as well, but really this is more about showing what the software can do and it really doesn't matter the context. So let's, without any further ado, go into the case study that we're using, um, which is a Harvard Business School case study called Destin Brass Products Company. Oh, one second. I guess I'm going to have to do it this way. Okay, Destin Brass Products Company. Destin Brass Products Company is a fictional company like many of the uh, Harvard Business School case studies are. They have three products. We're going to go into that in just a second. Um, the process that, or the uh, the webinar today is going to actually just talk about the process of creating and using a decision model in Excel using uh, at risk. So real quick, we're talking about Destin Brass products. Destin Brass products has three products that they manufacture: valves, pumps, and flow controllers. For our purposes, they may as well just be widgets. But uh, what we know about about the product line is that the valves comprise about 24% of the company's annual revenues, pumps 55%, and flow controllers 21%. The flow controllers, we know from the case study, uh, is, a, is not a very competitive market. Uh, they do 10 production runs per month, and they send out 22 shipments. Uh, valves are made with uh, four components. There's a high precision manufacturing process involved. There's only one distributor who's a customer for the valves. They do a single production run every month. And there's some competition, but there's not very much price pressure. And the pumps are five components to build, a similar manufacturing process to the valves. There are seven distribution, uh, distributors who are customers, and they do five production runs a month. There's a lot of price pressure for pumps, but there's stable demand as long as best in brass products keeps their pricing in line with what the competitors do. Uh, the specs for design and manufacturing are less precise than valves. This is all given in the case material, and it's really not that important to what we're going to do, but it's, it's background information. So with that said, step one in using at risk as a decision tool is to construct the basic model. Uh, it's what we call a deterministic model, which means that there aren't any uh, distributions built in. We haven't used at risk yet. So I'm just building a basic model. So here, a screenshot of the model that I built, I'd like to show you the model. You can see that it's a multi-tab model. But it, it really starts off with unit costs. There's monthly production. We'll get into the details of this all later. 
the monthly production. BOM, or the bill of materials, this is just essentially telling uh, the spreadsheet what the components of each of those different parts actually are and how much they cost. Labor, which is self-explanatory. Overhead, which is meant to be self-explanatory, but we'll see in a second that it's not quite so straightforward. And activity analysis, we'll talk about a little bit. And then the timesheet data we'll talk a little bit about too. All of these things roll up into cash flow, which I kept, just to keep the, the model simple, I kept cash flow as a single year cash flow rather than projecting out over four or five years. Now back to the presentation. The Destin Brass Products Company case is really a case that's intended to show a new method, or it's not so new anymore, but a relatively new method of cost accounting called activity-based costing. Some of you may be familiar with activity-based costing. The interesting point that we're going to work with uh, in our model is that with activity-based costing, we find that the traditional method for accounting for overhead costs leads managers to make really bad decisions in this case because it misstates what the actual profitability on a product line basis is. I don't want to go too, too much into detail on that because it's really out of the scope of this conversation, but let's just talk about the three products that we have. According to the traditional method of cost accounting, you'll see that uh, the valves have a, about $20 of gross profit per unit, and pumps, something just a little bit less than that, and flow controllers, just over $40. With a revised method, which is part of the case study and not, uh, not too worth going into that much detail on, um, they found that valves were actually much less profitable than that. Pumps were somewhat more profitable than they thought. And the flow controllers were much more profitable than they had thought. And finally, using the activity-based costing method, they found that valves were approximately as profitable as they initially thought. Pumps were much more profitable than they, than they originally thought. But flow controllers were actually a drain on profitability. Back to the model, and I'll show you what that looks like. The way that we modeled the this this whole manufacturing company is traditional method, revised method, and the ABC method. And each of these columns on my cash flows uh, sheet calculates the line items that go into the operating profitability according to each of those three methods. And you'll see that the model, it, one good check of the model being right is that the operating profit doesn't change based on what method you use to account for it. What changes is what's in the middle. Okay? So here's our basic model. We're going to focus now entirely on the ABC method, which, again, let me show you some pictures. The ABC method shows that the flow controllers are actually a drain on profitability. And there are several different ways of presenting that information. But this is what we're going to focus on, the ABC method. The next step in using at risk as a decision tool is to take the model that we've built, this, this deterministic model, and add statistical distributions to it. The step that I recommend doing is, at a very high level, going through the model that you've built and just asking yourself, which of these things might actually be subject to chance or management decision making? And that's what I've done here. You'll see that, there, that we're interested in, in each block on this little tree diagram, unit profitability, which is composed of unit price and unit cost. Simple as that. Unit price, as we all know, is, a, is really a pretty simple calculation of just uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. You know, never mind that. We're going to actually spend most of our time modeling the unit cost. We'll come back to price in a, in a minute, but most of the time that we're going to spend is on modeling unit cost. And you'll see that at the end of this tree diagram, each of these nodes are things that we're going to want to go adjust the model with statistical distributions. We're also going to, uh, let's come back to this. Okay. So, using, um, using at risk's really nifty function called color cells, what I can do is actually highlight the cells that I've built statistical distributions into the model. And it color codes them according to what I tell it to do and whether the inputs, whether those cells that I'm, that I'm modeling are inputs or outputs that I'm interested in. And you'll see what I did is direct labor. Uh, we built statistical distributions into direct labor. In the initial case study, they gave us that pumps, for example, cost $8 per unit in direct labor. Flow controllers were $6.40 and valves were $4 per unit. What I did was I said, well, let's assume that instead of $8 to manufacture, or indirect labor cost to manufacture a pump, let's assume that it's the, the uh, beta distribution as described in this function. Um, we'll come back to how we can actually use the, or decide what functions that we want to put in. But I, that's what I did as the, as the next step, was go through the whole model and add statistical distributions based on the tree diagram here. Flow controllers, this is the actual bill of materials. Labor, setup, run labor, and machine usage. and then timesheet data. So let's come back to unit costs. So that's pretty much it on setting up the model. What we did was build an initial basic model, identify the cells that we think might be subject to, to uh, stochastic randomness or management decisions, and then update those cells with, with at-risk functions that can help us do this. Timesheets I wanted to spend a little bit of time on because the timesheets are obviously uh, a big component of unit cost. It's how much time was actually spent by workers in the, in the factory manufacturing things. So what I did was I, I actually mocked up an example. In the real world, you'd probably want to go and collect real-world data from your, from your timesheets. I did a mock-up and took these empirical observations for the number of minutes that it took each time uh, one of these components was, was manufactured over the course of a fictional four-year period of time. And you can see that for valves, one time that they did a production run, it took 19.6 minutes per unit. Then the next time was 13.3 and etc. all the way down to 48 different monthly observations. Pumps, I did the exact same thing, but remember we were doing more production runs. The valves were doing one production run per month, so it was 48 months, one production run per month, we had 48 observations. For pumps, there are five production runs per month, so we've got many more, 48 times five, observations on how long in minutes that it took for each production run. Uh, per unit in, in each production run. And similarly for flow controllers, which were 10 production runs per month, that's going to have 480 different observations over the four-year period. Now, what I then did was I used another really nifty function of at-risk, distribution fitting, and I actually highlighted all of these, there, these, uh, these observations. Let's do this one. Highlight all of these observations and, and tell at risk to find the best statistical distribution to fit that data. 
I'm going to create a new one. And then click Fit. And as you can see, it gives me a list of, of statistical functions that actually find the that actually fit the curve, and it actually tells me the goodness of fit based on several different criteria that I can select from. And then I can just pop it into a cell by clicking right to cell. I'm not going to do that now because I have already done it. And here are the effects. Then I just used those in the run labor hours per unit in my original model. So that's timesheets. The other thing that I did, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on price like I, like I had mentioned before, but on the price of the flow controllers, which you'll see was $97.07 per unit based on just what the sales force was out there selling the flow controllers for, $97.07. What I then did was I said, well, what if we had some room to move that a little bit? So what I did was I used the August function because I knew what I wanted the distribution to look like, but I don't know what the mathematical function would be. So I used the August function in that risk, which I will show you. Distribution fitting, August. And this just allows me to draw by clicking on my mouse and literally draw the curve as I think it should be. And that gives me this value, which I'm going to plug into the model a little bit later and run another, uh, another simulation. So I wanted to talk about timesheets and price, and that's what I've just done. The next thing I used in the model was the sim table function, which I'd like to show you as well. In the bill of materials, I then assumed that there are, there are five components that go into manufacturing each or all of these three different products. There's a $1 component, $2 component, $6 component, a 7 and an 8. That was given in the case. What I then did was I said, well, what if I assume that the $1, 2 and $6 components all come from a single vendor, and the $7 and $8 components also come from a different vendor, or a single vendor? And now let's assume that those two vendors are actually competing in some of, the, of their pricing. So what I built was a correlation matrix. We're not going to actually use it in, in this webinar, but if we do another webinar, I'll pick up from here and add some other, uh, some other interesting information about how we can use these to further refine the model. Just wanted to show, though, that we can actually correlate what happens, uh, or we can actually use correlations between variables in our model and tell the model to, to update itself with those correlations. And the correlated inputs actually end up looking, or I, I chose one, this is a negative correlation, meaning that when the price of this product goes up, the price of this one goes down. That's a competitor response in this case. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the conclusion of how I added uncertainty to the, to the original model. Now what I'd like to do is talk about the real meat of it, which is, all right, well, how do we analyze the results of this, and how can we use that to actually enhance the strategic decision making that we want to do? We're going to come back to this profit chart real quick and say that, you know, faced with this information, which is the end of the case as, as it's written in the case study, faced with this information, the, the manager would ask, ask themselves, what should we really do about flow controllers? That's the obvious question that, we're, that we want to know. Is there anything that we can do about flow controllers? And I think that there are essentially two options. One is to drop it entirely, and the other is to raise the price. Those are really the only two options. We can't keep selling it at a, at a per unit loss. That we know 
sorry. That we know already, even without the decision modeling. So the first thing that I want to take a look at is operating profit, both overall and on a per product line basis, and and see what we what we've learned by building the the model with at risk. So In that risk, once we've um, once we've built the model and we've run the simulation, I can then click on Browse Results. And Browse Results is telling us, again, we know that the operating profit for the whole company is $541,000 and change. And that doesn't change no matter how we did the accounting. as you'll say. But what is interesting is now we've got this $14,000 loss on the flow controllers and we and we know that we want to do something about that. So let me come back to this bill of materials. One thing that I added to the case myself is the possibility that the engineering department said you know, we can actually re-engineer the flow controller and use a different set of parts that we've, that we've redesigned and a different bill of materials. So what I did here to do that in, in, in uh, at risk is I used this engineering design change, which is a simple zero one, so it's an if then. And then I built an if then formula into the model, so a, a regular straightforward Excel if then. But the engineering design change uses the sim table function to tell it what to do so that we can then run a separate simulation for each of those two different cases. When, when it's uh, zero, it'll run one simulation of a thousand iterations, and, when it, and then it'll go and automatically run a second simulation based on uh, based on the, the values that I told it for for the one. Let me show you what that looks like. We know that the flow controllers in our original case had 10 total components. There were four one dollar components, five two dollar components, and one eight dollar component for a total bill of material cost per unit of twenty two dollars. When I click on browse results, you can see that it says SIM1, and there are, there are 10 components total, 10. But now I can click on this little button here and show the results of simulation 2. In simulation 2, which is now in, uh, assuming a change in the en engineering design spec, now there are actually nine different components. And we'll see that instead of four, one dollar, five, two dollar, and one, uh, one eight dollar component. Now we've got, in simulation two, six, one dollar, two, two dollar, and et cetera. So we're using the sim table function to look at two different possibilities and run a, si a separate simulation at the same time for each of them. And that simulation is going to flow through the entire model each of those two times. The big question is, when we're into the, an into the analysis of results, is does that really make a difference? So now we've got this negative $14,000 or, or I'm sorry, this $14,000 loss on flow controllers in the year. Now I want to click on Browse Results again and look at the statistical distribution of the outcome. Now we know that with no engineering design change at all, we can see that we, that we can be 90% certain that the, con the net contribution from flow controllers in this case 
is somewhere between negative $19,000 and negative $8,500. Essentially, it's guaranteed to be non-zero, more than essentially. If I drag these range tools all the way out to the very end of the, of the to each end of the curve, now we've got, you can see that, we've now got a 100% probability based on the simulation that we ran of it still being below $4,000. So we know that we're losing money. But that's without an engineering design change. So again, if I come to this select simulation tool and say, well, what if I look at simulation two, which is with the engineering design change? Now it gives me a different outcome. And now you can see that we have 100% probability of being positive. And if we take the mean, uh, you can see here the mean is about $13.3 thousand dollars in that year. And that's a positive 13.3. So that's looking good. We might consider that as an option. The question is, what does that do in terms of uh, um, profit margin? Because I, I forgot to mention at the beginning, Best in Brass Products Company requires a 35% margin on all, all of their products. So now the question becomes, well, if we do the engineering design change, can we, can we achieve that 35%? Let me show you what valves look like. Without the, there, there is no engineering change, and we know that the that there is no problem with valves or with pumps. But let's look at it. Click on the browse results. We can see that the expected outcome is 34.7 percent, which is 35. And you can also see that the that we can be 90 percent certain that the uh, that the profitability margin for valves is going to be between approximately 30% and just just over 38%. As a manager, I would say that that's probably close enough to 35 to just do some tweaks and not to, not worry about it too much. No major changes. Similarly for pumps, pumps are just at an expected value of about 40% profit margin and the rate the 90% middle 90% range, we can be 90% certain that that profitability is going to be between 38% and 42% which is fantastic. Here comes the big question. What about the flow controllers and the engineering design change? Without the engineering design change, again, simulation number one, again, we saw, uh, we, we, were, we saw a negative value for the profitability, so now we're seeing a negative margin, expected value of about negative 3.6%, uh, and we're 90% certain that it's actually below negative 2 uh, percent, or actually between negative 2 percent and negative 5 percent. Now let's look at, risk at simulation number 2 with an engineering design change. And now we can see that yes, it's, pro it's profitable, but it's really far off from the required 35 percent. So the engineering design change by itself may not actually be a solution that's, that's valid for us. just want to show you that if I click on show all simulations, we can show them together and visually compare the difference. But again, we're seeing a negative 3.6 and a, approximately a uh, you know 4% margin with an engineering design change. So now we, we've basically taken one option as a decision off the table using at risk. I also wanted to talk about analyzing sensitivities because now we, these are, we want to make sure that we spend our effort changing things that we can change that also will result in the, in the kinds of outputs that we'd like to see. So what's actually driving profitability? I'm going to come back to the operating profit on this cash flow page. Total operating profit in the activity-based costing method. And again, click on Browse Results. But now instead of looking at the statistical distribution of the outcome, I'm going to click on this tornado diagram. And I'm going to look at change in output mean. 
this is showing us in a really easy to digest visual way what the most important variables in our model are in terms of how they uh, affect changes in the output variables that we're interested in. Right now, since we are selected operating profit for activity-based costing, cell D34 in the cash flows tab, this is showing us the relative impact of a change in any of these other var variables in the model. And you can see that the prices for, com for the components from vendor number one are the most important variable. A small change in those prices results in a lar relatively large change in profit. That's good to know. Another thing is that the direct labor cost is the, is the next most important variable. What about for flow controllers, though? Do the same thing. We'll click on tornado diagram. And again, we can see that for this specific product, the, the components that come from vendor one are the most important variable in terms of how, they have, or how the, that changes in that variable affect the operating profit, which is what we're really interested in. So now we're starting to think, hmm, here's a good place for us to focus our effort and to make sure that we, that we understand the competitive environment really, really well, because we want to affect changes. We want to affect changes in the, in the prices coming from vendor number one. So that tells us what's driving profitability and what important variables are under our control. The next question is, should we be, now that we've, that we've modeled risk and variability into the, into the, uh, the original model, is flow controller still even the thing that we want to be focused on? So, Oh, actually, we've already covered that. Sorry. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is will a price change matter? This is the, the, the shape of the curve that I drew in that artist functionality. And now I'd like to actually show you what happens when we do that, when we make that change. So what I'm going to do is, just to make it easy, I, I built the... Uh, I built that function in a separate cell, and now I'm just going to copy the function and paste it into the price and rerun the simulation. Here where it says Paste that 115.57, and I'm going to run a new simulation. I apologize for how slow my computer is running. And you can now see that at risk and Excel are populating the, the, this cell with uh, values that fit that curve that I drew by hand.
my computer normally does not run that slowly. I think that the uh, web conferencing software is pretty expensive. All right, so now we've, we've actually run the simulation, and now we have this distribution built into the price of flow controllers. Now it's just a matter of going back to our cash flow and seeing what the, what the outcome is now that we've gotten a price change, a, a hypothetical price change that we're considering. We can now see that based on simulation number one, again, with no engineering changes at all, we can see that, um, that the expected value, the mean for, profit, uh, for net contribution from the flow controllers is now about $60,000. And if we do that price change with an engineering change, that bumps that expected value up to $87,000. So the question is, does that meet our 35% gross margin target? And we come back down to ABC actual gross margin per unit, which is 13%. So we already know the answer for, for the base case model. But let's look at it anyway. Click on Browse Results. We can see here that with simulation number one, no engineering changes at all, and the price change, that we expect a value of, uh, I'm sorry, of a, about, there is it, thank you, about 12.8%. So that's below, what's well, significantly below our 35% uh, target, and we're 90% certain that it's going to be between 4.13 and 18.45%. In fact, we're 100% certain, based on everything that we told the model, we're 100% certain that with a price change and no engineering change, we're still going to be significantly below a 35% gross margin for this product. What about with an engineering change? Simulation number two tells us, well, it's a lot better. But now we're still expecting about 18.7. That's actually not a lot better. I'm sorry. Let me show all simulations. And there you can see side by side on the same scale what that would actually look like. So now the red distribution curve is showing us with no engineering change and a price change to, re to reflect what, what I had drawn by hand, and the blue is with the same price change and an engineering change. And it looks like, in any case, we're still significantly below 35%. So now, we really don't even need to bother the sales force and say, hey, do you think you can get $116 for this product instead of 97 Because we know that even if they can, it's not going to help. So based on all of this, my recommendation would probably be let's get rid of flow controllers unless we can get a much, much higher price than I modeled in. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much it. I wanted to keep the, the, uh, the model itself and the questions that we ask about the model fairly simple just so that I could demonstrate basic use of, of at-risk modeling to enhance the strategic decisions that you can make with a, with a spreadsheet model. Again, if we do, if we do an update to this, uh, or a follow-up, I'm sorry, to this webinar, we'll probably explore a few other interesting things like the price correlation in, in a competitive market and possibly uh, economic ordering quantity, which is basically uh, optimizing the size of your production run based on uh, inventory holding costs. All of these things are really interesting questions that I think can be made much easier to answer well when you factor in stochastic uh, stochastic variables into the into the Excel model. So that's all that I have for presentation. I don't know if there are any questions or not. Well, Steve, thank you so much for this. I definitely let's do another one. Let's uh, let's keep going with this. We could do. Uh, another one and maybe a third one we'll, we'll make a series out of it we really appreciate this i i i uh 
I was, Maybe I, was ho I was hoping that this uh, this this unit was going to win and they were going to make it somehow. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 manufacturing piece that they just decided they're just not going to make it. But <laughs> you know, sometimes you you know you have a you have an inkling of what's going to happen and then finally you put it to analysis and realize oh right where it's just not worth it. So this was a this was a great example and we really appreciate it on our side that it was very no yeah. And uh, well and maybe in an upcoming one we can actually focus on uh, on digital media which is that, that would be great true, true expertise but I thought this was a was a, a good case and I've I've actually done activity based costing implementations in a former life. Uh, and I just thought it would be interesting to look at as a as a good example. Were there any questions that I need? Let's to see. Answer? Let's see. We'll wait. We'll wait a second, folks. If you have any questions, you can just type them in either the chat or the question panel. I'll read them off. Sometimes you've answered all the questions that uh, come up, and that's uh, because of the the way it was laid out. It was very logical and. Moving Either forward. that, or I just, or I aimed the material too low for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're getting, we're we're getting some, uh, we're getting some thank yous and kudos here. Let's see what we have. I'm going to go to my dashboard. Good. Would you be willing to uh, share the slides that you in this webcast? Sure. Oh, good. And uh, oh, oh, how about the model? You don't have to share the model, but our our folks always ask that, and they they may have to watch um, it and build their own model. <laughs> here's we here's what I'll need that. to do. What I'll need to do about that. I'm happy to share the model. I just need to check with Harvard Business School Publishing okay, cool. and make sure that I have permission to do. That. Understood. We did. And we'll, we did get permission from them to do this webinar. Uh, I'll just need to check with them. I, yes, I doubt yes. they'll. That they'll see a problem. Good, good. And if that, yeah, we'll, we'll, folks, will check that first before we. And the there we have a questions about the recording that should be up on our website tomorrow. Okay. I should have a link later today myself. Okay. So and uh, let's see what else we have. Any other questions? Um, well, thank you everyone for bearing with me. This was actually the very first webcast that I've ever given, and I. It was great. And it was super. We, we we know that there's always one or two things and we really didn't see them we we've uh, um, go to webinar itself has had a problem with uh, uh, allowing users to advance slides in a way that they want to <laughs> they're so hopefully they're gonna run an update about that and uh, yeah other than that and then this was also a I think one if not the second uh, webcast that we've run in the, on a Mac and in a virtual Windows environment, and that, I think that worked great. And I oh yeah, for, yeah. The Mac yeah. Uh, Windows is. Windows XP Office 2007 running in parallels on a MacBook Pro. <laughs> Excellent. And you and you know that the people are different organizations that would surprise you, like the FBI and some other organizations are moving towards Macs. And I see that wow. on my, my GSA emails that I that I get here and. So it's very interesting. So this is good. That this is a good that this this works in a way that uh, we can recommend. Great. Let's see. Oh, good. No more kudos. More kudos for you. Thank you. And uh, see if we'll, we'll wait one more one more minute. See if we have any questions that come in about the what's featured in the webcast. And if you're watching this recording in the future, please feel free to reach out to us, and we'll we'll get your questions answered. Yeah, I believe um, I I included my own contact information on the title slide. Yes, yes, you did. Good. Yep. Yeah. If you're watching a recording, go back to the beginning. You'll see. I don't see any now. Folks, feel free to reach out to us and. In the next day or two, if something comes up that you're thinking about, and we're gonna we're gonna do some more. So, so we appreciate you to we appreciate, we appreciate that you are here. And uh, yeah, Steve, let's definitely plan another one. 
All right, that sounds great. Great. See where we can creatively take it. Sounds good. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jameson. Thank you, Palisade, and thank you, everyone who joined. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.